Okay, here we go. We're going to look at the Gospels, and in this one, we're going to dig deeper. How many of you like are digging deeper into the Gospels? I love it. But what's amazing is the second half ties into the first half. The first half, Exodus 35, 1, it talks about how Moses assembled the congregation. What was the Hebrew word for assemble? Oh, I gave it to you the first half. Kahal. Yes. Yes. Kahal. Now, kahal means to assemble. Now, let me ask you something. How many of you have heard of the Septuagint? There were so many Jews who spoke Greek, okay? Remember, you had the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire, and the Roman Empire was started around 70 BC, okay? And, and here we're about, you know, 2580 or whatever you want to, 2780. So uh, Greek was still very well known. I, I mean, like the United States is the only country that there, we're not multilingual, like most countries. But back then they were multilingual. For heaven's sake, they, uh, especially the Jewish people, they knew Hebrew. Uh, they knew Aramaic, they knew Greek, they knew Latin. The Roman Empire spoke Latin, the Greek Empire spoke Greek. You know, the Jews also knew Hebrew and they knew Aramaic. But the Septuagint was written, does anyone remember about when it was written? About 132 years before Messiah was even born. That's a long time, 132 years. They took the Tanakh and they translated it from Hebrew into Greek for all the Greek Jews. They didn't do it for the pagans. The pagans weren't going to read it anyway. Okay, so the Old Testament or the Tanakh was written in Greek for Greek speaking Jews. Now, they, oh, more the fact, many did, the fact it was written in Greek because to understand the word of God, you really need to learn Hebrew. Whenever you translate it into any other language, you lose so much. But it was, oh, and the other thing is, they didn't write it in the New Testament. It wasn't written in classical Greek. It was written in gutter Greek, Koine Greek, the comma Greek, like ain't and all that kind. I mean, so when you look at the New Testament in Greek, it, it wasn't really nice professional Greek. It was gutter Greek. It was the common language. That's something else that's very important to understand. Now, again, like I said, there were no Greek pagans interested in reading it. All right. Now, the word kahal was translated into Greek as ecclesia, ecclesia. And so what it means, let me show you this. Okay, if you remember, we have a holy calling. This is 2 Timothy 1.9, a holy calling. You see that? And here is the word, it's kaleo. The biblical word often used in scriptures means to call. That's why they say the church is the called out ones. Okay, it comes from ecclesia, but it, the Greek word is kaleo, and you can see this here, and it means to call, but it's not an ordinary call. It's not like one of these um, random marketers calling your cell phone, okay? No, this is a special call. It's the same call that appealed uh, to Moses through the burning bush. It's the call that Beacon Samuel laid at night. Okay, this is a specific call. It's just like if someone's invited to a party at your house, this isn't a, a call, hey, everybody come to my house. No, it's a specific call to persons that are invited. That's what this kaleo means. It's someone who's called out. Now, here's the thing. Here we go. Here we have the Septuagint. The Hebrew word kahal is what the Greek word kaleo comes from. And that word ecclesia, call, you almost hear call, call, call me. Okay, CL, call. Ecclesia comes from the 
root word kaleo, which comes from kahal. Now, 132 BC, they put Ecclesia, right? Well, let's think about this for a moment. Did you know Ecclesia, in the Greek versions of the Old Testament, was used over a hundred times? Ecclesia was used in the Greek over a hundred times in the Old Testament. Now, it means what? What does kahal mean? Kahal means assembly, to assemble. Kahal means to assemble. So what does ecclesia mean? To assemble, right? Okay, now this is important. But then, all of a sudden, ecclesia gets translated into English as church. Wait a minute. How can ecclesia, over a hundred times in the Old Testament, doesn't mean church, but the very same word that's translated as assembly over a hundred times in the Old Testament, it's still Greek. How can we change the Greek now to English saying church? There were no churches in the New Testament, guys. There were no churches. There were only assemblies. Now, here's the thing. Do you think there were any churches in 132 BC? Okay, and they use Ecclesia over 100 times. It never meant church. It meant assembly. Now, in the third century BC, here's what happened, or second uh, century, Look at this. A group of 72 Jewish scholars were commissioned to translate the Old Testament into Greek, which was the common language at the time. And this is what would have been circulating around Yeshua's day. When Yeshua was there, the Septuagint was already there. It was written 130, 150 years before he was even around. So in the synagogue, some may have been using a Greek translation. Some would have been using a Hebrew translation, the actual Torah scrolls. But the thing is this, ecclesia or ecclesia was a common term. Okay? Now, it's important that this gives bearing on the use and meaning of a particular word. So in other words, we need to go back when they heard the word ecclesia, what were they thinking? Not what are we thinking now, what were they thinking? Because that was the common word. And that meant what? Assembly. Now, the very first time ecclesia is ever used in the Tanakh is Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10. It says, the day that you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, assemble me the people, and I will make them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children. So here, they're at Mount Sinai. And they're assembling together. That's the ecclesia was there at Mount Sinai. Look at Deuteronomy 9.10. And the Lord delivered unto me the two tables of stone written with the finger of God, and on them was written according to all these words which the Lord God spoke with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the Ecclesia. So here, Ecclesia. This is on Mount Sinai with Moses and the tablets. Look at Deuteronomy 10.4. And he wrote on the tables according to the first writing the Ten Commandments which the Lord spoke unto you in the mount of the midst of the fire in the day of the Ecclesia. And the Lord gave them to me. But did you know Ecclesia didn't just mean an assembly? It also meant an assembly going to war. A war assembly. Look at Judges 20 verse 2. And the chief of all the people, even all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves to the Ecclesia, the people of God, 400,000 footmen that drew swords. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 47. And all of this ecclesia will know that the Lord doesn't save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Okay, ecclesia. Did you know there's also a heavenly ecclesia? 
Look at this, Psalm 89, five through seven. And the heavens will praise your wonders. O Lord, your faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints for who in the heavens can be compared to you, the Lord? Who among the sons of mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the ecclesia of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. They're talking about the heavenly sphere. There's an assembly or an ecclesia up in heaven that are also ready to go to war. Now, get a load of this. It should be pointed out that of the 162 times of the word kahal in the Hebrew Old Testament, 162 times, 96 times it is translated as ecclesia, okay? Because it means the same thing in the Greek Old Testament, but around 45 times it's also translated as sunagage, which means synagogue. So the ecclesia, the called out ones, are also a synagogue. Ecclesia and sunagage are the same word. It's like dad and father. It's referring to the same person. Ecclesia and sunagage means the same thing, and they both mean what? Assembly. Okay. Now, let's look at this. Um. So once again, we can see the overlap in range between Ecclesia and Sunagage. If we understand that Yeshua, listen to this. If we understand Yeshua was not inventing a new concept. With that statement, I will build my church. No, I'll build my Ecclesia. Rather, he was utilizing an already very familiar concept. Now, let's look at Matthew 16 and 18. And I say unto you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my what? Church. No, it's Ecclesia. I'm going to build my assembly, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, let's jump here for a second. Here are all the Greek gods. They had Poseidon. You remember Poseidon? Aphrodite, Zeus, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Hades. These are all the Greek gods. Now, do you think the Greek people that were serving the Greek gods would read the Torah? No, they're not going to read the Torah back in this day. But we know the Romans overran the Greeks. And so here's a list of all the Roman gods. Many of you are familiar with uh, here's Hercules. Remember Hercules? Okay, Artemis, Apollo, Zeus, or Jupiter. There's Neptune, there's Pluto, uh, Vesta. Remember the Vestal Virgins I told you all about? So there's all the Roman gods. Okay, well, let's look at this. Okay, here we are. Moses was around 1500 BC, all right? The Jewish people, and now here's when Yeshua was born, right in here. If you weren't Jewish, you were pagan. Until Messiah came, okay? There was the Roman gods, there was the Greek gods, and then there was the God of the Jews. Now I ask you, before Messiah was born, were there any Christians? Catholic churches. No, no, no. Okay, so look at, this is the King James Version, which is an error. Sorry for all you King James only. Look at Acts 7, 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. What? What, are you, are you telling me Moses is in the wilderness? There's the ecclesia and there was a church sitting there? There was no church in the wilderness. Why does it say the church in the wilderness? Because the word is ecclesia and, and they're translating it as church now. This is why the Young's literal translation, okay, what does it say? If you look at the next verse, this is he who was in the what? Assembly. There you go. We, why do we take Ecclesia and say it means church? It never meant church. It's always meant an assembly. Okay, look at Acts chapter 19, verse 
33 through 34. This is when they're all worshiping the great goddess Diana for several hours. It says, some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander was motioning with his hand, and he wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was Jewish, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And then look at the next verses. When the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis? And of the sacred scone that fell from the sky. And when he said these things, he dismissed the, guess what? The word is ecclesia, but they don't want to translate it as church because then they'll think the church is worshiping God. So this shows you the bias in the translation. What? How come now you take ecclesia and turn it into assembly when everywhere else you make it church? Because you're anti-Semitic and you're trying to uh, separate the synagogue from the church. Now, you talk about Alexander and motioning him to go forward. Do you know who this Alexander was? Do you remember the guy who ended up carrying the cross for the Messiah? He had two sons, Alexander and Rufus. This is Ale the Alexander, okay, that was the son of the one who carried the Messiah's cross. Okay, so now let's also dig deeper into the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Messiah says to them, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Okay, so many people are trying to build their own kingdom and look at all the things they possess. Now look at the next verses. And he spoke a parable to them. The ground of a, what? Not rich man, but a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And look at what he thinks within himself. What shall I do? I have no room to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have much good laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And then who shall all those things belong to that you provided? Now, if you don't know the Jewish roots, you don't know who he's talking about. Who do you think he's talking about? Solomon. King Solomon, which is a type of antichrist. Watch this. Tell me if this doesn't sound like Solomon. Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 6. I made me great works. I built me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees and them all kinds of fruits, and I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. Look at verse 9. So I was great and increased more than all who ever were before me in Jerusalem, and my wisdom remained with me. The next verse. There is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall be forgotten. And how does the wise man die? He dies as the fool. And then look at this. Now you have to remember Solomon built the temple. Okay, well, he really didn't. But we give him credit. You're going to see he really didn't. But look what he says in Ecclesiastes 2, 17 and 18. Therefore, I hated life. Solomon says he hates life because the work that is wrought under the sun is even grievous to me. It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor, which I had taken under the sun, because I have to leave it to someone else. He was the biggest narcissist of all time. Can you imagine? I mean, some people, boy, if I could only have fame or if I could only have fortune or if I could only have power, he had it all so that he could build God's kingdom and he was too worried about building his own. And so he hated life because it was all about him. And the church thinks Solomon is the greatest thing that needs to come about. He's the type of antichrist, guys. Now, Go back and look at this uh, 
Luke 12, again, go back a little bit, Luke 12, 16 through 20. He says, so you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Well, guess who wrote Ecclesiastes? Solomon. And look where he wrote in chapter 8, verse 15. Then I commended mirth because a man has nothing better to do under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. Everyone knew he was talking about Solomon. Solomon is just consumed with everything he can possess. Why? I just don't understand why. Now, look at Deuteronomy 17. This is verse 16 through 20. God is speaking of the king that's to run Israel. And he says that the king, now remember, this is like 400 years before Solomon. It's a long time. He's not to multiply horses to himself. Hmm, what did Solomon do? He multiplied horses. He's not supposed to cause the people to return to Egypt. Oh my gosh, not only did he multiply horses and return to Egypt, he sold them to the enemy. It says he bought horses and chariots, which is like the modern day tank, and he gave it to the Hittites and the Syrians. He was an arms merchant against his own country. And then it says, not only that, neither shall he multiply wives. I think he had a few, maybe he just didn't know his multiplication tables. Okay. And then it says, it's so that his heart doesn't turn away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Well, he did that. And it'll be when he sits upon the throne of his kingdom, he has to write his own copy of the law in a book out of that which is before the priests of the Levites. In other words, he couldn't hire a Levite to write it for him. He had to personally write the whole Torah in his handwriting so he would know without a doubt what God said. So the Levites would stand over him watching him to make sure he doesn't erase a jot or a tittle. And it will be with him, and he will read there in all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, to do them, that his heart not be lifted up. Our heart is to lift us up to go to work. And the Torah is to make sure that his heart doesn't get lifted up. Now, this it says that he may prolong his days in the kingdom. Now, as far as did Solomon build the temple? No, and I will prove it to you. First off, look at this. First Chronicles 28, verse 11 and 12. It's King David who gave to Solomon the blueprints and of the houses and of the treasuries and of the upper chambers and the inner parlors and the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that David had by the spirit not Solomon, and the courts of the house of the Lord and all the chambers and the treasuries and the treasuries of the dedicated, dedicated things. Now look at 1 Kings 5, 13. And King Solomon raised the tax out of all of Israel and the levy was 30,000 people. Okay. Wow. He has 30,000 people working on the temple. Verse 15, Solomon had another 70,000 that bore burdens and 80,000 that's 180,000 more workers. How many of you ever worked for a boss who took all the credit for your work? I mean, here, you know, I mean, here these all hundreds of 80, 200, 300,000 people are doing the work, and yet Solomon gets all the credit, and he doesn't even lift his finger. Now, what did dad say? His dad, David, said to him in Psalm 127, verse 1, and it's for Solomon. Explicitly, this is for you, son. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And so what do we see in the dedicatory prayer of Solomon's temple? He sang a prayer to the Lord. And look what he says in 1 Kings 8, 13. I have surely built you a house. What about the other 300,000 people that were doing the actual work? A settled place for you to abide forever. In the same prayer, verse 20. And the Lord hath performed his word that he spoke, and I am risen up in the room of David my father, and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and I have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. 
And then we find in 1 Kings 8, 44. If your people go out to battle against their enemy, whithersoever thou shalt send them, and pray to the Lord toward the city which you have chosen, and toward the house that I have built for your name. And then a few verses later. And so return unto you with all their heart, with all their soul, in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto you toward the land which you gave to the fathers, the city which you have chosen, oh, and the house which I have built for your name. Well, let's look at Deuteronomy 8, 11 through 14. Beware that you don't forget the Lord your God and not keeping his commandments, his judgments, his statutes, which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten and are full and you build goodly houses, you dwell there. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. So what do we have here? I am great. Look at me, my work for God. And then what happens? Our heart gets lifted up. Okay. So the question is, does your heart stir you up to get the work or do you lift your heart up and it's all about me? This is what it comes down to. So, you know, I, I really believe that this is the day. This is why God, uh, Yeshua in the Gospels, people are going to say, didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I do all these wonderful works in your name? And he's going to say, I don't know you, you workers of iniquity. So here are these people that are prophesying in his name, doing mighty works in his name. He calls them workers of iniquity. Why? Because their heart got lifted up. It's all about, look what I did for you rather than having our heart lift us up to go to work for God, so he gets the glory, not us. But can you see how Ecclesia has been totally mistranslated? It doesn't mean church. There were no churches in 132 BC. Over 100 times it is in the Old Testament long before there were any churches. But because of anti-Semitism, they want to take the word ecclesia, which means the same as synagogue, an assembly, and make it separate as this is the church, as if it, God was, or Yeshua was creating something new. No, he wasn't. He was talking about what's been around for thousands of years. But what's amazing is the word synagogue, which means what? Assembly. It's synagogue, but it means an assembly. In the book of James, where it says that there's someone who is wealthy and he comes into your assembly, don't give them preference. Remember that verse? Guess what the word is there? Synagogue. Oh, we can't put synagogue because then they'll think they're meeting in a synagogue. So we're going to write assembly. But then in Revelation, it talks about the synagogue of Satan. It's the same word, synagogue. Why did they translate that as synagogue over here? But they translate it as assembly over here because the writers were biased. How many of you know the media is biased? And guess what? The translators were too. And this is why Danny and I are working on a Bible, the New Testament, where we're going to make corrections and we're going to have the Hebrew right there in the text. And you can see it for yourself. All right, let's stand.